Let's pray. Father, we are ever, ever so grateful that we can gather in this place, that we have a place to gather, that we can come together and collectively um, worship you, celebrate you, um, devote ourselves to you, contemplate you, and and to love you. We are so grateful and so thankful um, for who you are, for all that you do in our lives, through our lives, with our lives. Your goodness to us every day, Father, we so often and far too often take such things for granted. But Father, the very breath that we breathe, the very life that we have, the health that we have. And while we struggle many a time through life and sickness and, and illness and suffering, by and large, we are a very blessed people. And we are grateful for that, Father. We are thankful. We're thankful for your Son, the greatest gift this world will ever know, the greatest gift that we can ever know our Savior, our King, and our Lord. And we worship Him, and in doing so, we worship You. And so we thank You. Thank You, Lord Jesus, that You didn't leave us alone, but You sent Your Helper. And so we thank You, Holy Spirit, for the new life that we have because of You, that You breathed into us life anew, and that You're in us, and You seal us, and we're secure, and we're heaven-bound. We are so grateful that you guide us and, and lead us and transform our lives. And any fruit that we have in our lives that are, that's good and holy and righteous and true is simply because it's your fruit. And for that, too, we are grateful. Thank you for your word that guides us and directs us and, and challenges us but rightly so, as we need to be challenged. Help us, I pray, not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed. That through our lives, we may prove to all what is good, acceptable, and perfect. And so as we look into your word here this morning, Father, open our eyes as the psalmist would declare and desire. Open our eyes to behold wondrous things from your word. And then change us. And then rightly use us, we pray, for your glory, for your namesake, and for your great kingdom, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Well, you know you're getting old when you begin to look back on your life in terms of eras. I grew up in what was called the Apollo era, named after the Apollo spaceships. Now there are some here this morning that don't have a clue as to what I'm referring to simply because you've grown up during the space shuttle era. All you can remember are these large airplanes flying out to space and flying back. In fact, it's so common we really don't think about them as spaceships anymore. They fly up, and a little while later, they fly back, and they actually land on an airstrip. But I grew up in the Apollo era, a time when spaceships were real spaceships. They were the real deal. I'm talking Tim, the tool man, Taylor kind of transportation. When they took off, everybody said, oh, 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 oh. When these bad boys took off, it was no small journey. When they took off, they were headed for what seemed like infinity and beyond. When I was young, I remember watching the Apollo 11 mission from beginning to end. It's the first time man actually set foot on the moon, and it was thrilling. 
I remember watching this incredible rocket taking off from the platform. I mean, flames, flames billowing out from beneath this massive machine as it began to take off the ground. Flames shooting from beneath the vessel. It began to race towards the clouds. And you begin to realize that this rocket was sailing through space like a missile. And then the tail would fall off and you'd gasp like it was falling apart. And then another set of rockets would ignite. This huge flash of flame would send the Apollo spacecraft hurling towards space. We all watched, amazed at the sight, to see this jet-fueled skyscraper go up, 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 and away. As a child, I was mesmerized by such wonders. In fact, I had a model replica of the Apollo 11 spacecraft, including that little lunar module. It took me months to put that model together. I mean, all kinds of parts, all kinds of glue, all kinds of glue everywhere. And finally it was complete. And there I was in my room. Ten. Nine. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Lift off. And I'd take that puppy up, and I mean that puppy was this tall. And I'd take it up. And that first chamber could detach, and I took it off, and whoo, the next set went. And then I rose even higher and higher. And then, then the smaller portion of the Apollo aircraft, the one that would detach and go towards the moon, well, that puppy came off and whew, there I am going around the room. And then the very tip of that, it would open up and then the lunar module would come out and whew, there I was with that little dinky thing. And then I'd put it all back together. And I'd do it again and again and again. My mom never heard me count so much. Ten, nine, eight, seven, three, two, one. Lift off. Well, as far as liftoffs go, Scripture provides for us a glimpse, a glimpse at the greatest liftoff this world is ever, ever going to know. Turn with me this morning to Luke chapter 24. And I want us to look at verses 44 through 53. God's divine liftoff. Luke chapter 24, beginning with verse 44. Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. And that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came about that while he was blessing them, he parted from them. And they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. One translation would say that while he was praying, as he lifted his hands and blessed them, that he was carried into the heavens. The ascension of Christ is one of the great doctrines of the faith 
and the great doctrines of the church. Unfortunately, it's also one of the most forgotten, one of the least celebrated. Yet when we look at the early church, when you look at the history of the church, we find that they celebrated Christ's ascension as a pillar of their faith. In fact, it's one of the supreme statements found in the Apostles' Creed. Concerning Christ, it says, He ascended into heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. It's not just that He rose again. It's that He rose completely. And while such creeds seem to be outdated and can be written off as irrelevant, the early church staked their very lives on such statements. They fought for such statements. They would die for such statements because they stood on such truths. And they did so because such statements protected the very faith that they would live for, the very faith that they would fight for, the very faith that they would be willing to die for. And so the early church celebrated the ascension of Christ as a pillar of the faith that they held tightly to. In fact, throughout history, the ascension of Christ has been honored as a celebration. Even more amazing, today many pagan nations celebrate the ascension of Christ, while we here in America too often don't. When I was a student at Moody, went overseas, and we were in Indonesia, and Indonesia is considered to be 95% fanatic Muslim in their faith. Uh, They kill Christians there, they burn churches there, they destroy churches there, and they excommunicate anybody that is from the Islamic faith that becomes a believer, and boy, do they pay a hefty price for their faith. And while I was there, we were um, part of a, I was part of a puppet team, if you can imagine that. I tagged along with the missionaries, and they found something for me to do. They said, can you do puppets? And I said, excuse me. They said, can you do puppets? And I said, well, I guess I'm going to begin now. And there I was, and I practiced. But we set up our puppet display in the middle of a huge, huge national park that we found was filled with thousands, and I mean thousands, of people. And they were there spending that day together as families and as friends. And the reason for it was everyone had the day off. In this 95% fanatic Islamic nation, they had a national holiday and they were all enjoying it and rejoicing in the day. We discovered it was the celebration of Ascension Day. A national holiday for everyone. And of course, everyone celebrated. And while they celebrated the day for the wrong reasons, it's just another holiday, tragically in the church today, we don't celebrate the ascension at all. We celebrate the birth of Christ. We celebrate the resurrection of Christ. But too often we forget to celebrate the ascension of Christ and we move on to other things. It's been two Sundays, three Sundays now since Resurrection Sunday. The stores have cleared out the shelves and we've cleared out our living rooms and life goes on and we move on and a holiday has gone and we're back to the mundane of life. But scripture doesn't leave us there. Luke concludes with this important aspect of Christ's mission and Christ's ministry. As the church, we want to celebrate Christ's ascension and all that it represents and then to contemplate for a moment what it means for us here today. When we celebrate Christ's ascension, when we truly take it all in, we recognize in that moment Christ's lordship. In the incarnation, we see Christ's humility and his humanity. In the ascension, we see Christ's majesty and his absolute deity. God the Father exalts Christ to the highest position in heaven and shares glory and universal recognition 
of His Son. And all the worship that would be to the Father prior is now shared with the Son. And we worship Him as Lord. The name above every name. It's not Jesus. Because that name was bestowed upon Him in the ascension. He raised Him up. And gave him the name above every name. Prior to that, everyone knew him as Jesus of Nazareth. Some might call him Lord. Very little clue as to all that meant. But with the ascension, he is now declared with absolute certainty that he is Lord. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Given all rule and authority for all time, all power and all glory over all of creation for the whole of eternity. We see this beautifully depicted in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. We know it as the kenosis passage, the self-emptying of our Lord, leaving the glories of heaven behind and not clinging to them, but emptying himself. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Make no mistake about it. He is Lord. And His church should declare it. And one day, even those that don't recognize it will be found before Him. They will declare it as well. They'll at least recognize it as well. When we celebrate the ascension of Christ, we celebrate the Lordship of Christ. But we celebrate it in the right way. Not a legalistic tendency. Not a rigid set of rules. But He's Lord of life. He's Lord of my faith. He's Lord of my circumstances. He's Lord of my home. He's Lord of my marriage. He's Lord over my household. He's Lord of this church. He's Lord of us all. And when we do that, we celebrate His authority to rule and to reign over our hearts and over our lives. We celebrate His divine authority. And when we do that, we we celebrate His capacity to judge with, with pure and perfect judgment, to rule with perfect wisdom, and to reign with perfect power. It's His absolute authority that protects us from anyone or anything for all of eternity. And men and women, I don't want to delegate, I don't want to relegate that kind of power, that kind of authority, that kind of right to rule and to reign to anybody else but Him. I don't trust anybody else but Him with that kind of power, with that kind of authority. Nobody on this level and on this human plane is capable of handling that kind of stuff. The best of us, the very best of us, could never handle that kind of power. We don't have the wisdom. We don't have the knowledge. We don't have the strength. We don't have the capacity. He alone is worthy of such things. Oh, we try to live as if we could. But how often do we find ourselves coming back to Him time and time again saying, Lord, isn't that the prayer? Lord, 
I'm tired of trying to manage my life. I'm, I'm tired of trying to control my company. I'm, I'm tired of trying to run the world. I'm tired of trying to figure out my family. I'm, trying to, I'm, I'm tired of, 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 of trying. I'm, I'm, Lord, please help. In the different areas of our life, one by one by one, when we hit the place of sheer exhaustion, or we trusted somebody else to handle it, and they failed us. But time after time after time, we bring it back to the rightful place it ought to be, and we say, Lord, please help. Lord, I need you. It's recognition that he can and I can't. He will when I won't. He's able when I am absolutely unable. Look at what Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. And we looked at this passage last week as well. It says, I pray the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you'll know what is the hope of your calling. And we looked at the hope aspect last week. But what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ. When he raised him from the dead, but not just raised him from the dead, but seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Now, what are we talking about? Well, Paul gives us a glimpse. Far above all rule, far above all authority, far above all power, far above all dominion, far above every name that is named. We sang that song. Every name that's named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Please look very closely at verse 21 and how Paul wants us to absorb the verse. Christ is given the position of divine authority, absolutely absolute, you might say, over all rule. And he uses that figure of speech, many hands to slow us down, far above all rule. We'll just fill that bucket up with all of the ways anyone at any time can rule. Fill it up with all of the factors and all of the personalities and all of the positions and all of the power. You fill that puppy up. Let the, let the cream rise to the top. Burn off the dross and try to find the nugget of gold. Do your best at that. But once you fill that up, understand this. He's far, far, exceedingly far above all rule. Well, let's not stop there. He's far above all authority. You fill that bucket up with everything you can think of. And once you've filled it to the top, understand this, he's far above it all. And power, the power that everybody wants. Well, we won't admit it. We won't admit it. But I see pastors struggle with it. I've struggled with it. I've seen elders struggle with it. I've seen people struggle with it. I've seen kids struggle with it. We all want it, but the, the great truth is we can't handle it. But think about the most powerful people in this world or those that want the most power in this world. Some use it well, some not so much. But you fill all that up. Take all the power that we can muster in our humanity. Fill that bucket up. In fact, why don't you combine it all? Think of the most powerful people in the world and throughout the history of the world. Just pack them on in. Look at all that power. Far above. And dominion. Oh, kingdoms come and kingdoms go. Leaders rise and leaders fall. 
far above and over every name that has ever been named. Think of the people. Think of the great people. Think of all those names. Far above every name that has ever been or ever will be named. And all things have been placed under his rule, especially and primarily his church. And the power that raised Christ from the dead, Paul tells us, is the power he extends to his saints as long as we understand. It's his power, and all that might is to be used for his glory. Too often today, the church is debating the lordship of Christ, and they are, instead of embracing his lordship. If Christ isn't Lord, then we are a doomed people without any chance of heaven. If Christ isn't Lord, then we have no hope of overcoming a single temptation. If Christ isn't Lord, then mankind is left to rule, and that scares me to death. If Christ isn't Lord, then he isn't worthy to receive our worship and our praise. If Christ isn't Lord, then he isn't worth living for. Listen, listen to what the Apostle Peter has to say in Acts 2, verses 32 through 35. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, you have to understand the ascension is all about his exaltation. That's why we celebrate. And having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, this picks up right where Luke left us off. He's poured forth this which you have both seen and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, here's the conclusion. Here's how we wrap this all up with application. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And because Christ is Lord, he is worthy of all praise of all glory, of all honor, and of all worship. Because Christ is Lord, he is more than worth living for. Because he's my Lord, he is worth dying for. Because Christ is Lord, he's worth every single breath that we could ever breathe. Scripture tells us that Christ is the head of the church, We are his members. That Christ is the vine. That we are the branches. That he is our great shepherd. And we are the sheep of his flock. He is the head of the church. He is our great high priest. We are his royal priesthood. And then scripture tells us that Christ is the groom. And we are his bride. Talk about holy matrimony. Wrap all this up. And what it should tell us is that Christ alone is the one we call Lord. He alone is able to lead us with pure truth, with pure love, with pure care. He guides us in all of our affairs. He protects us in all of our endeavors. He promises to bring us home to himself. He loves us with an unfailing love. 
He nourishes us with his word. And he cherishes every single one of us. But oh, there is more. Plenty more. He gave his life for us. To spare us. To deliver us. To redeem us. He searches for us. He finds us. He saves us. And he secures our very souls. He tends to our every need, is intimate with our every hurt. He listens when no one else will listen. He understands when no one else understands. He prays for us when we cannot pray ourselves. He stands in the gap for us when we fall due to our own failures. He's strong when we are weak. He's rich when we are poor. If we bear any fruit at all, it's because of Him. If we have any life at all, it's because of Him. If we have any joy at all, it's because of Him. If we have any hope at all, it's because of Him. If we any, have any hope of heaven at all, it is because of Him. He's a rock. He's our Redeemer. He's our salvation. He's our King. And if we are to be led in this journey called life, then He alone must be our Lord. We tend to think of His Lordship and what He drives us to do. We divide over such things. His Lordship fuels my devotion and my dependency upon Him. And the ascension celebrates all of that. That he is my exalted king. He's my exalted savior. He is our exalted Lord. But I think that there's another important aspect in dimension that we need to contemplate. When we celebrate Christ's ascension, we contemplate Christ's longings. We don't often think through these lenses, but I think we should. I think it's hard to imagine what the disciples actually witnessed the day Christ left. Luke tells us in Acts that they were talking. And then Christ started to rise up. And then he kept going. And going. And going. Until they couldn't see him anymore. It was divine lift. Can you imagine? I mean, they'd seen the risen Christ, but they didn't see him rise. Now they are witnessing divine liftoff. I don't know about you, but the only thing I can picture is several human jaws now resting on the earth. <laughs> They are flat out, no longer hinged. They are literally down by their feet. Can you imagine? I remember when I was younger watching one of the early NBA slam dunk contests. And the dude was a little bit younger at the time. His name was Michael Jordan. You ever hear that name before? I think he's got some sneakers out. And all oh, the competition is kind of getting narrow and it's tight and it's the last round. And Dr. J. Julius Irving looks over to young Michael Jordan, gives him the nod because the first ABA slam dunk contest, Dr. J. won. He came flying down the court and he left about the free throw line. Most of us can't shoot a free throw and get it to the hoop. He launched from that free throw line and in the air dunked the ball. And all of a sudden there's Michael Jordan. And he's come down the court, and he hits that free throw line, and he's airborne. And up, up, and away he went. Now, we all know what goes up must come down unless you're Jesus Christ. Well, he went up. But the thing that caught my attention was this. There was a photo of it, and it ended up being a poster. And most people walk up to the poster, and they, they look at Michael Jordan, and they look at him in the air. I saw past that. And I saw the faces of those that were in the stadium, especially the first old ten rows, because you get a little closer view. If you look past Jordan 
to see the facial expression of people in the stands. And what you saw was this. Because they never saw a flying person before. And there he was in the air. And you've got people doing one of these things. I think sometimes, I think sometimes we just have to slow down and allow God to use our imaginations. Not to outthink the scriptures, but to expand the scriptures. The disciples had to be standing there going, I could be here all day, folks. <laughs> Their jaws hanging wide in open amazement, maybe even shock, as they witness Christ actually rising up and out of sight. But I'd like us to imagine the other side of the story. Heaven's side which is another jaw-dropper. I wonder what it was like when Christ came back to heaven. You ever think about that? You ever think that maybe the angelic realm had to stop for a moment as their jaws dropped too? I'm not sure if the cherubim and the seraphim had jaws. I know they've got plenty of eyes and wheels that go round and round, but if they've got jaws, I'm thinking they're probably dropped for a moment too. I wonder what kind of reception Christ received when he rose up into the clouds. Oh, the disciples are sitting there speechless and silent. But I wonder, I just wonder how loud the praises were when he entered into his glory. Can you imagine? I wonder just how deeply he longed to be back with his father. His longing to return to his eternal abode forever and ever. His longing to reunite and be reunited in the presence of his father. And when we know that from Scripture that he had those longings. We know it from his prayer in John 17, 1 to 4, 1 to 5. Father, now that I've accomplished the work that you have sent me to do. He hadn't even done it yet, but he saw it as finished. No doubt about it. It will be completed. But now that I've done that, now bring me back home to you. We know he had those longings. And that's what he left. That's what he gave up. That's what he didn't cling to as he came down to cling to the cross. To know there'd be a moment in time where the Father turns away from him for the only time in all of history because of our stuff, our sin. Scandalous. And that moment of saying, if there's any way to get through this other than this, but yet not my will, your will be done. Because I don't want to miss you for a moment. And for all of eternity, we've been there side by side, and I could look up to you in any moment of time, but in this moment, you're not here. Think of the longing. Think of our longings when we long for our children to come back home or to visit. Or to go and see them. Think of the longings. Think of his longing. But scripture tells us there's another reason why Christ left. John 14, 1 to 3. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, if it weren't so, he'd be the first one to tell us. He goes, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. I think we need to grab a hold of this one. Christ left. 
so he could prepare a place for us. Longing to be with his father. And while he was here, that deep longing to be back home. But now that he's home, he's longing for us to be with him. I think of the television programs about the homes of the rich and famous. Terry and I watch these all the time. Some of these homes are masterpieces of construction. I mean, they are amazing structures. When I had my flooring company, we accounts in Highland Park, Lake Forest, very affluent, very elite communities, uh, homes that, quite frankly, we could have fit our house in their garage. And there was a home one time we got lost. We found ourselves way back in what they called the servants' quarters. Doorways so wide because they were made so that the, the ball, they had the ballroom, not a family room, a ballroom, and they would have the ballroom dresses. And the doors had to be wide enough when they opened up that they could enter in. Marvelous, marvelous homes. And I think if most of us are honest, wouldn't we mind living in one of those for just a few, few days? Christ tells us, you can't even begin to imagine what I have prepared for you. Can you imagine what Christ can do with a little over 2,000 years of home remodeling? Can you imagine the detail? Can you imagine the architecture? Can you imagine? And he could do it all with just a word. But he's chosen to spend all this time to get heaven ready for us. And one day he's coming back to take us home. In the meanwhile, he is preparing the house. Our Lord provides an even greater truth to contemplate. So that where he is, we can be also. It's hard to imagine how much he longs for us. Christ tells us, this isn't your home. Your home is with me. It's his presence. Christ longs for that day when we'll be with him. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. We're his joy. Can you imagine, as much as we long for heaven, Christ longs for us even more. That he's waiting for us, far more than we're ever waiting for him. And while he's waiting for us, he tells us we're to be watching for him. To keep an eye on heaven. For the one who went up is going to bring us home. I don't know about you, but I can only imagine. It's one of my favorite songs. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in awe of you, be still. Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Or will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine when that day comes and I find myself 
standing in the sun. I can only imagine when all I will do is forever. Forever worship you. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. And that's what we celebrate. Until that day, may we be found ready for his return. And then men and women, up, up, and away. Let's pray. Father, we delight in you. We delight in your Son. We celebrate this day and continue to celebrate the resurrection. But we absolutely celebrate his exaltation. And we honor him. And in so doing, we honor you. We love you, Lord Jesus. And we gladly bow before your throne. For you are our King. You are our Lord. And we worship you. It's in his name we pray. Amen.